Uh, good morning. My name is Lieutenant Joe Hayes of the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office. I'm also, uh, I have the privilege of being a member of the SPARC Board. And on behalf of Hope Family Services and SPARC, we'd like to welcome you to our program and we thank you for attending. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Matt uh, Walsh, who will be leading our program. Thank you. Matt. Thank you, Lieutenant. Good morning, everyone. Looks like a pretty wide awake, robust crowd. <clears throat> um, I also want to thank you for attending this morning and uh, being here to help us acknowledge Domestic Violence Awareness Month and learn more about uh, one of my favorite organizations, Safe Place and Rape Crisis Center, and the Hope Family Services in Bradenton. You know, um, domestic violence has been a part of my life for 11 years, but in a good way. My wife, Lisa, has had the privilege of serving as a member of the Board of Directors of Safe Place and Rape Crisis Center for all that time, for those 11 years. And she will tell you that of all of the volunteer work that she has done in her lifetime, no organization has been more gratifying to serve than SPARC. And the reason is very simple. It's the work that SPARC does. Now, my wife Lisa is not allowed to tell me any of the details of what goes on at SPARC. All I get to know is where she and Olivia Thomas and the other board members go for dinner after their board meetings. Nonetheless, Spark holds a special place in our, in our hearts, and here is one reason why. Uh, a few years ago, my wife Lisa asked one of our senior female staffers if she would consider serving as a board member for Spark. So late in the day, this woman came into Lisa's office teary-eyed. Teary-eyed because she was, said she was privileged and honored to be asked to serve on the SPARC board. And she said it was because, and I quote, SPARC saved my life. SPARC, she said, saved my life. <clears throat> Her story like all Spark stories, is gut-wrenching. But thank God there has been and still is a happy ending to her story. And her story and others like it are what keep Lisa and me motivated to try to do what we can to help Safe Place and right, Rape Crisis Center. <clears throat> so I think if all of you think about it in this room, I'm sure that just about everyone here has had an experience with domestic violence. Indeed, if you think about it also, it's almost like mental illness. It has sort of a stigma to it, you know? And that certain stigma says that it's a problem that all of us need to recognize and confront and deal with as employers and leaders in our community and in our workplaces. To give us a sense now of how domestic violence filters out into our community, I want to bring to the podium our state attorney, Ed Brodsky. Ed?
Thank you, Matt. I want to begin by uh, thanking Spark, Hope Family Services, Sheriff Tom Knight and Sheriff Brad Stubbe for inviting me here today and giving me an opportunity to say a few words today about the importance of domestic violence in our community. And I thought I'd talk to you a little bit about it from the state attorney's office perspective, from a criminal justice uh, perspective. But as I reflected on this morning and the opportunity for all of us to get together to speak about this important topic, I have to be frank with you that as your elected state attorney, it, it really did inspire me and remind me of the importance of my role as your elected state attorney in fighting domestic violence and the efforts that we need to make myself personally and our office in our battle against domestic violence. So while it inspired me, I would hope that because of the fact that all of us gathered here this morning to come together to hear about domestic violence and the great services that, that Hope Family Services is providing to us and that SPARC is providing to us and that law enforcement is providing and the courts and the prosecution is providing, but I would ask for it to perhaps reflect upon you and inspire you as you come today to listen to this message and to hear and to gather with us that it inspire you about the things that you can do to battle domestic violence in our community. Because the sheriff's office and law enforcement agencies throughout our community can make the efforts to make the arrests and go out and investigate these cases and those cases can then be referred to our office for prosecution, but it's the things that we can do as a community coming together, banding together, to prevent those cases from even coming to the state attorney's office or from law enforcement officers even having to go to that home to investigate that incident of domestic violence. <clears throat> it's no secret to those of you that, that work in the front lines, that are out there in the trenches battling domestic violence, that this is an epidemic in our community. This is a problem that's pervasive and that affects and, viol and uh, intrudes upon all of us in all aspects of our community and our life. It invades the public and private lives of men, women, and children because the acts of domestic violence don't only impact men and women, but they have a significant impact upon our children and what they have to do with and what they have to see and what they have to witness and how they have to cope with a family that is having domestic turmoil. So in order to fight this epidemic, we do have to come together as a community. We have to step up and be vocal and join in our efforts to fight against domestic abuse. And that includes our leaders in our communities and it includes all of us coming together to do that. Our community needs to see that that we do not tolerate and that we will not tolerate this culture of domestic violence. And so it starts here with people like us, with me and you. And as your state attorney, I'm proud to say that I'm proud of the relationship that we have with our law enforcement agencies, the work that we do with our courts, the work that we do with agencies such as Hope and Spark, and everything that we do in order to combat uh, domestic violence. At the state attorney's office, we do place an importance and a significance in our role in battling against domestic violence. It's not just about prosecuting that offender that comes into our court, it's also about having that special relationship with that victim and doing everything we can to help that victim and support that victim through the process. And our efforts by prosecution are aimed at preventing a new offense from reoccurring within that family unit. Empowering that woman or that victim to be strong through the crisis and ensuring that the offender does not repeat that offense again. That's most important to us. And I can tell you that 
we see time and time again, not only here locally in our community, but we see it nationally, that when a celebrity gets arrested, or as we see time and time again sometimes here uh, in an in a, uh, important position in our community, that oftentimes when there's an incident of domestic violence, what happens to the victim? The victim sometimes is placed in a, in a position of pressure where in order to maintain the family unit or to make peace is under pressure to forego prosecution or to no longer assist with law enforcement or to recant their statements, which is a horrible message for someone who has been the victim of a crime to be placed into. So something that we've done at the state attorney's office to deal with this issue and the very nature and problem of a victim who is placed in a onerous situation of how to deal with the fact that they've been victimized at the hands of domestic abuse, but yet they feel this immense pressure that they have to either recant their statements or no longer cooperate with prosecution, is we've turned to a different model at our office. And we call that uh, evidence-based prosecution. And we let victims know when we review a case for criminal prosecution that the victim isn't the one that's going to decide whether we proceed. And we take that burden and that stress away from the victim. And we let the victim know that we will decide based on the facts and the evidence in the case. Certainly we will take into consideration what they have to say, but we review all of the, the evidence. Are there witnesses that, that witness the event? Is there independent uh, evidence that will support a prosecution? And oftentimes, despite the, vic the victim's wishes or her reluctance because of the fear that she's in, it's important that we battle domestic violence in our community. And so using evidence-based prosecution, we take that burden away from the victim and we proceed accordingly if we're able to. Statistically here, I had an opportunity to take a look at the numbers in our community and to give you some perspective on how much domestic violence impacts our community. In Manatee County, for the year 2012, there were 2,607 cases of domestic violence. Five of those cases resulted in a homicide in the year 2012. And that's five cases too many. There were 16 cases of domestic abuse that involved forcible rape. There were 400 cases that involved aggravated assault, the threat of a weapon or the threat to cause serious injury. In Sarasota County, there were 1,445 cases of domestic violence. Seven of those cases involved a domestic homicide. 22 cases for forcible rape. And there were 174 cases involving aggra aggravated assault. And what was the common denominator? This breakfast today was called the Men of Courage. The common denominator that we see in, in all of these cases when we look at the, uh, the gender of the offender is what? Men. The majority of the perpetrators that come before law enforcement and when law enforcement has to investigate an incident of domestic violence or a defendant or a case is referred to the state attorney's office, overwhelmingly the majority of the offenders that come before us are men. And so we need to do something to create a change in the culture among men. And that that's why this is an important day for us to be here today. It's the men of courage to stand up, take an active role in your community, be engaged in efforts to prevent domestic violence so that law enforcement never even has to respond to that home. And when we looked at the dynamics within the family network, we saw that most often the victim in a family situation is often the spouse, followed by parent, 
So there are cases of domestic violence that occur by a child with their parent. And then it became the child after that. And then it was a sibling. But when we looked at 2012 and we looked at the year prior, 2011, the good news, the good news for Manatee and Sarasota County is that domestic violence has gone down from the previous year. But we have a long way to go because the change from 2011 to 2012 has been less than 10% reduction in domestic violence. So we have a long way to go because those seven homicides that occurred in Sarasota County and those five homicides that occurred in Manatee County are seven too many and are five too many. Something that I read as I prepared for my comments today that I thought echoed in my mind was that what we have to remember is that violence is always a choice. Violence is always a choice. You're not forced to do it. You didn't have to do it. You made a conscious decision to resort to force, to violence. And we need to stand together to say that that's not going to be tolerated. Lastly, I'll just talk to you about some legislation that, that the state attorney's office has been working closely with the legislature. And, uh, and I know Representative Jim Boyd is here, so I'd like to thank the legislature for their efforts uh, in regards to domestic violence. And uh, our office had a big role in that. Uh, Heather Doyle from the state attorney's office, who's in our domestic violence unit in Manatee County, uh, had some impact in this. But last year, we saw um, an amendment to the Florida Evidence Code which we call the Forfeiture by Wrongdoing Act. And oftentimes we see offenders that prohibit or do something to intimidate or prevent a witness from being able to come into court or a victim from being able to come into court. And last year we had an amendment to the Florida Evidence Code that said if a offender does something to prevent a victim or a witness by intimidation or threat or could be a homicide from preventing that witness from appearing in court, that statement, that victim's previous statement will be admissible under forfeiture by wrongdoing. And so I think that was an important piece of legislation that passed last year, and so I'm grateful to our Florida legislature uh, for supporting that. This year, again, we're working uh, with various groups here in our community and, and speaking out to uh, the legislative body this year, and we're seeking again to seek some changes. There's a number of states that have uh, um, allowed for a victim's statement that was originally made to law enforcement in a situation where the victim wants to recant her statement because oftentimes the biggest thing that we have to battle is a victim who wants to recant because of the pressure that they're in. Well, we're seeking this year uh, an amendment to the evidence code that allows a victim's previous statement to be admitted. So I can tell you that during my time at the office, we've seen a significant number of cases. We're working hard with this evidence-based prosecution model. We're working hard to address some of the areas in the law that we think can be improved to battle domestic violence. And because all of us are here today, and I know that this group was largely for the men, I would say that men, because we are responsible for perpetrating the cycle of violence, it's important that we do everything that we can together as a community to end this epidemic. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ed. <clears throat> I'm sure that many of you in business out there, executives and managers, <clears throat> remember that um, you, you were taught to leave your home issues at home when you went to work. And you probably tell your employees to do the same thing. But I'm also going to bet that many of you executives and managers here know that that is not realistic. 
and that you need to confront these issues because you see how they affect your employees and affect your workplace. We've experienced it in our company a few times. Now, I never thought that I was going to have to become a psychologist and a counselor for our employees, but I realize now that that is one of my most important roles. And I suspect that all of you have found out something similar. So there are things that we can do about this as leaders and managers in our businesses. But we're going to hear a little bit more ab about other steps that we can take. What can you do in your business to confront domestic violence? Well, we have the lady here for us today who can tell us exactly what we can do. So I'd like you to please welcome to the podium Laurel Lynch, CEO of Hope Family Services in Bradenton. But no pressure, really, we're going to tell you how to fix it. You! <laughs> okay, that's uh, a little ambitious, but today is a really good start. And I would be negligent if I didn't say first and foremost, thank you for being here. Because you are men of courage for being here. And a few women of courage as well. But thank you. I feel like I'm leaning into the mic, so. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about workplace violence and the kinds of things that we are encountering every day, but I first want to say thank you to the lieutenant who gave me an extra 30 seconds when he opened because um, we all have a time limit. And if you know me, you may have to get a hook. I have grave difficulty sticking to the time limit. I have a tendency to go on and on a bit. So Olivia's got a hook, and uh, I hope to be as inspiring as our state attorney was. I also want to tell you that I've been doing this a very long time, and when I really count the years, I'm a little uh, chagrined to tell you. Uh, I wasn't five when I started, but we're coming up to 30 years I've been in this business. I worked at Spark many years ago, and now I've had the pleasure of leading Hope for the last 17 years. And I have to tell you, we really have come a long way. One of the things you'll hear resonate this morning, the message repeatedly said, is that we've got a long way to go. But I truly would be negligent if I didn't tell you, having been on the front line for all these years, we really have come an awfully long way. There are men of courage among you here this morning that I know personally. And I certainly can't list everybody because we'll be here all day. But I, I need to share with you that uh, one of our board members, Dr. Bob Hillstrom, is a plastic surgeon. And the reason I know him and met him is because he repaired a client's face after her boyfriend bashed it in with a brick. So he was a man of courage when he offered to do that at no charge. That's pretty amazing stuff. And that was years ago, before we were all talking about this. Our board president, Len Tabakman, who I call for everything under the sun, probably drive him a little crazy, but we won't talk about that part, um, who has been a man of courage in supporting us, not only with his hard work, but financially for years. Our most longstanding volunteer at Hope is an 80-plus-year-old gentleman who probably wouldn't appreciate me sharing that part with you this morning, who's been a volunteer at Hope two days a week for years. He comes in and does data entry, what I think the most boring possible job under the sun could ever be. And one day when I said to him years ago, so, Bill, how come you do this? He said, because my mother was battered, and I couldn't really help her. But in my small way, I want to help all the women who are coming to you today. That's a man of courage. And so for those, you know, Paul Scharf's here, he brought his sons. Yay! <laughs> Bravo! Because that's the change we're going to see in the future. So those of you that I know and those I haven't mentioned this morning, thank you for being here because you are men of courage. You are standing up to demonstrate that you get this. You get what we're about and what we do. So again, thank you. 95% of the people who are murdered in the state of Florida at the hands of their significant other never call on an organization like Spark or Hope for help. So let me just say that again because I think it's a point worth repeating. 95% of the people killed don't come to us. So you heard there were 12 homicides between the two counties last year. I don't know all their names, but I dare say they weren't our clients. So like everything in life, there's a plus and there's a minus, right? The good news is what we do works. We are saving lives every day. 
why aren't we getting this other 95% in? And that's where we need help. And that's where we need your help. We all know the folks in our neighborhoods that we go to church with, that we work with, that are probably in a situation, at a minimum, we might want to ask them. So what's going on at home? Are you safe in your home? I mean, it's so simple to just say, do you feel safe at home? Are you doing OK? And when you identify somebody who says, yes, in fact, I am going through this, they probably won't say, I'm a victim of domestic violence. I know that's shocking. People don't talk like that out in the real world. But they may say, well, I am scared of my husband or my boyfriend or my partner. I don't know what to do. Well, you have the resources to help them by having them reach out to us. That one phone call that they make may, in fact, save their lives. In the workplace, as, we were, as uh, Matt was just sharing with you, I don't want to really, you know, I'm trying to think of ways I can be a little upbeat, but the topic is anything but upbeat. Domestic violence affects productivity and increases absenteeism for both batterers and victims. 36% more absenteeism by folks involved in domestic violence. So that has an impact on your bottom line. That has an impact on your earnings. 24% of women between the ages of 18 and 64 have been a victim of domestic violence. That's really our workforce. 74% of battered women report that they were harassed in their workplace by the batterer. So how long is that going to work for you as an employer to have a batterer showing up and causing all this stress? Not, I don't think you're going to really you know, be all that thrilled about it. 47% of senior executives polled said that domestic violence has this negative impact on their workplace. They know it exists. In EAP programs, some organizations, some bigger places have EAP programs. It's a great idea. I highly recommend it. 71% of EAP providers say that they've dealt with an employee who's been stalked by a boyfriend or a husband at work. That's an awful lot of people. And lastly, 83% of the people in the EAP programs, employee assistance programs, have helped, have helped workers with what we call an injunction for protection, a restraining order, a civil court order of protection. So it's there. You know it's there. We certainly know it's there. And the best way you can help is to refer that person to us. That's what we do. Together with that victim, that person coming through the door or calling, we do something called safety planning. And it is the cornerstone of our work. What we believe is that safety planning, that sort of dress rehearsal in your head that we're going to help somebody do, they're the expert on their batterer. We're the experts on domestic violence. We put our collective wisdom together. We can help them craft a plan that will keep them safe. So going back to 95% of the people killed in Florida by their partner never came to us, I think the difference is that safety planning. I also think we can do better. If you're an employer, we're happy to come and talk to you. We're happy to come provide materials. Spark has fabulous materials. We do as well. We're happy to come talk to your staff during a staff meeting to tell you what to look out for. There are clues. There are signs and symptoms. But if it's not on your radar, I dare say that you'll never see them. So let us help you to have a better, safer, more enlightened, if you will, workplace. That's what we're here for. We have a speakers bureau of phenomenal speakers, and we're happy to do that. And lastly, I have to tell you, one of my most favorite men of courage is Charles Clapsaddle, who leads the METV crew. And if you're not doing anything later this evening, because of course we all started nice and early this morning, we are doing a one hour special on METV this evening to help bring awareness to this. Because one of the things that our board, me, our staff, what we talk about all the time is how can we reach more people? How can we do a better job of engaging the community in the work that we do? Because truly, we can't do it alone. We need your help. And so METV is hosting a one-hour special tonight. We have survivors talking about their experience, a little bit more about the statistics in our county, specifically in Manatee County. And I would invite you all to tune in. I've heard it's at 8 PM. 
Uh, my board president said that. Reliable source, right? Um, 8 p.m. this evening, he'll have to give you the channels. I only know the Bright House is 614, Fios 31, and Comcast 19. So please tune in because I need your help. We have to spread this word. Our state attorney, Mr. Brodke, couldn't have said it better. 12 is 12 too many. We really don't need any more domestic violence homicides. And we are getting better, but we're not quite there yet. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a man of courage. And without further ado, Mr. Walsh, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. <clears throat> I recently heard this guy by the name of Clark Gilbert. Uh, he's the uh, CEO of Deseret Media in Salt Lake City. It's probably one of the most successful newspaper companies, media companies in the country. And uh, he talked to this group of newspaper executives about how his company's newspaper is putting a big emphasis on family values in its content, a change for media companies. And in the process of telling this, he spoke about the extraordinary, extraordinary decline in the United States among boys and males and how they are losing ground in education and suffering from a desperate lack of role models. And it struck home. We need to make a difference, gentlemen men of courage. We need to be those role models. So at this time, I'd like to bring to the podium a woman of courage, the CEO of Safe Place and Rape Crisis Center, Olivia Thomas. Thank you, Matt. I just want to join in everyone else in thanking each and every one of you for being here today. Would we name this the Man of Courage Breakfast? Honestly, it was what Orlando calls theirs, and we're trying to start a state thing. We didn't really realize how significant it was to be a man of, a man of courage to be here. From all the people who told us why they couldn't be here and all the myriad of excuses, I was shocked that there was any traffic whatsoever in driving here this morning because I think everyone I know said they were out of town. We had some really creative ones. Um, Jeff Bell, I think, had the best. For those of you who Captain Bell, um, he fell off his roof to keep from having to come. He, he did. In all seriousness, we do wish him a speedy recovery. It really was a serious injury, but he was supposed to uh, record the video you're going to see next. And uh, so uh, my son-in-law, Patrick Duggan, stepped in and did it for us at the last minute, so we appreciate that. Um, but on the serious side, Napoleon has defined leadership as being able to define reality and then to give hope. Each of you here is a leader, and you can demonstrate that leadership when you leave here today by defining the reality and joining this conversation about domestic violence. And you can also lend hope by changing the narrative on how our community deals with domestic violence. So what we would like for you to do, we've got a very short video, it's uh, less than two minutes, and we will have you out of here by nine, as promised. But our call to action is, when you leave here today, if you would like to be recognized as a man of courage, we ask that you drop off a business card. For those of you who didn't bring a business card or have them, we have cards, just sign your name. We would just like your permission to publicize that you are a man of courage on our websites and in some other materials. So we would like to recognize you for being those men of courage and thank you for being here. So what does it mean to be a man? Men are more than a cliche, more than a sports analogy. We are not defined by our clothes, our business suits, or how much we lift in the gym. Being a man doesn't mean we don't like theater, romantic movies, or even cooking. Men cry. We care, we feel, we even worry. So what does it mean to be a man? Being a man means standing up, standing up for what is right no matter how hard it is. Throughout history, Great men selflessly stood up for causes they believed in. Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Gandhi. They stood up, courageously, regardless of the obstacles. Courage in the face of obstacles. To me, that's what it means to be a man. So men, do you have the courage? The courage to stand up, 
selflessly stand up in the face of obstacles, the courage to stand up against an epidemic that is plaguing this community, this state, this nation, the epidemic that is domestic violence. When you stand up against domestic violence, you are helping more than just an individual. You are helping a community, a community that includes your businesses, your friends, and your family. I choose to live in this community, as you do, and I want my family to enjoy a life here, free from violence. If you have the courage, support Spark and support Hope Family Services. Stand up today and fight to end domestic violence, because personally, as a man, I know it's my responsibility. I'm standing up. All right. Who in this room is a man of courage? Get up. Awesome. <clears throat> On behalf of Sheriff Knight, Sheriff Stubbe, Olivia Thomas, Safe Place and Rape Crisis Center, Laurel Lynch, Hope Family Services, thank you for attending. Have a great day. Make a difference and be a man of courage. Thank you for being here.